All right, good day, everyone. This is Jason Strait with the Pass Cloud Virtual Group. Uh, our presenter today is Rob Sewell, Sewell, Sewell and his uh, presentation is SQL Notebooks in Azure Data Studio for the DBA. Uh, before I hand things over to him real quick, I'm just gonna go through a few announcements. So the first announcement is this virtual group is sponsored by Microsoft Azure. Microsoft Azure sponsors this virtual group and hopes that folks will become more familiar with the Azure uh, features and avail what's available out there as we're looking to move our data platforms to the cloud. Coming up next week on October 14th, there's an Azure SQL Digital event. Uh, one of the premier speakers for that event is Bob Ward. Uh, if you're not familiar with that uh, event yet, it's uh, something worth going and checking out. Uh, so you can do so by going out to aka.ms slash Azure SQL Digital event. So a good opportunity to learn more about building out data platforms in the cloud. Uh, if you are not yet a member, you can become a member by going out to cloud.pass.org, clicking on the login to subscribe, and that'll get you into our newsletter that, that lets you know about all of our upcoming presentations. Okay. Uh, in regards to upcoming presentations, we got quite a few that are on the uh, schedule already going through March of next year, uh, in some cases up to two a week. Uh, so we got uh, Rob here today. Uh, next week we have Mike Nelson. And then we've got a uh, number of different uh, opportunities throughout the uh, next six months. <coughs> uh, even though we do have lots of speakers, I'm always looking for more presenters. Uh, we're trying to do two per week uh, when we can uh, find the uh, speakers. So if you're interested in speaking, you can go out to the virtual group website and out there there's a link to join the call for presenters. Alternatively, if you just wanna do uh, get information to me real quick, you can just email me at cloud.pass.org. Coming up this fall is the Virtual Pass Summit 2020. Uh, if you have not registered for that, you can get a discount code for that. Uh, this year's summit will be 100% virtual. Um, the discount code for that gets you $50 off the registration, and there's that discount code right there on the screen. This virtual group is part of a number of virtual groups that Pass helps to support. Uh, they cover different areas such as data architecture and women in technology and some focus on different uh, specific uh, uh, cultures and uh, uh, languages such as global Chinese and global Spanish. So lots of different opportunities to go out there and learn more about building out data platforms. And I am sure throughout the session you are going to have a few questions and if you do please type them into the question panel and then at the end we'll go through the questions with Rob. Uh, time no, permitting. No, no, no. Jason, Jason, please yep. interrupt me as we go. Okay, I will interrupt you as we get questions. Just, yeah, just just do do the thing because uh, All right. it's Sounds much good. better if people get info when they need it. Okay, we will do that. And, and I'm then, easily uh, distracted as well. Yeah, no problem. And then, uh, uh, that's all the announcements. So I'm gonna hand things over to Rob here and we're gonna have our session today, SQL Notebooks in Azure Data Studio for the DBA. Rob, you will be presenter here in just a moment. Excellent. Let's pick a screen. So we're going to pick with a bit of luck. Uh, I can you see will, OneDrive. You can see OneDrive, yeah. The reason you can see OneDrive is because my PowerPoint has crashed. Oh. So what we're going to do is going to use a backup. Um, luckily, I keep all of my presentations in GitHub, and I keep my GitHub in um, OneDrive. So whilst we're doing this, if you ever want to find my presentations, you can find them at my GitHub page. Uh, let's try this one. Here we go. Let's try that. So that was a fun start. Awesome. Let's start from the beginning. Does that look to you like a slide? It does. Yay, I'm a pro. <laughs> so look, this is me. Hello. This is me in my office, sat getting. You might find that a kitten will appear at some point, but we'll. Yes, you. We'll go back to this one. So we're here to talk about Jupyter Notebooks for the DBA. 
I will flip through this because this is a thing. So this is a presentation I gave to Wellington in New Zealand. And it's a bit of a joke because I live just outside Wellington, but not that one. That one is a beautiful place. I haven't been there, but I was due to go there this year, but something happened in the world. So I live about 400 yards away from where this picture was taken. It's a beautiful sunrise in the southwest of the UK near a place called Wellington. And in fact, the first Wellington in the world after which all of the others are named. They're all named after the Duke, but he took his name from our little town. So we are going to talk about somewhere even further away, Jupiter. Uh, okay, this is a picture of the south pole of Jupiter taken on a flight by, uh, by Juno. Um, but we're not actually going to talk about that one. We're going to talk about this Jupiter. And the name comes from the planet. And I throw in advertising slides all over the place. Uh, but it also comes from the core cool programming languages that are supported by Jupiter. So Julia, Python, and R. Uh, but most importantly, it comes because Galileo discovered the moons of Jupiter. And when he did so, he published his research with the data so that other people could see the calculations that he'd made and they could take that data and then they could validate that his results were correct. And this feature of reprodu reproducibility was really important to the folks that made Jupyter Notebooks. So what's in Jupyter Notebook? Well, originally it was for people like Terry and Simon here, the data scientists of this world. The folks that take data in all sorts of forms and write models and use Spark and Python and R and do stuff that I just don't understand. But before we go any further, let's just go back in time a little bit. I want to talk about running queries. You see, in the old days, when the beard wasn't as long, we used to query our SQL Server databases using tools that looked like this. And they had one single problem. They probably had many problems, but there's one unique problem that they had starting back from these early, early days, two and a half decades ago. Houston, we've had a problem. PowerShell, which I love, has the same problem. I might have just pointed it out slightly to you. If we look at Management Studio, Management Studio has got the same problem. So let's imagine that it's three o'clock in the morning, because these things always happen at three o'clock in the morning, and your pager goes off. Okay, these days, uh, Teams alert fires or somebody phones your phone or whichever method of notification you get, pager duty maybe, comes through and you get out of bed and you try not to wake up your significant other and you creep in, grab your laptop, you sign into your VPN and get onto the jump box. Oh no, not that jump box, onto this jump box and you only see what the problem is. And you've got a critical problem with number one most important P1 system. And you investigate it. You follow the knowledge that you've gained over the years and you find out what the problem is. And whilst you're doing that, you're writing queries, you're opening new tabs, you're opening new queries, maybe using different tools. And each time you're doing that, you're gathering this information and then you're uh, recording it, hopefully. When I was a production DBA and I was called out, I always had a notebook that I would write things down, times when things happened. And then I would screenshot, I got really good at screenshotting what was happening and putting it into Word documents. 
and then gathering it together at the end for the for the wash up meeting the next day. But just imagine. I'm sure this happened to you. It definitely happened to me. But at three o'clock in the morning, you run this query. OK, this is just a sales query against the customer database. But imagine that store ID 934 was the first thing that we came got back. And you realized that that was incorrect and what was causing the problem and you made your decision and you fixed the issue and then everything went right and you tested it and then great and you went back to sleep. Next morning, you have a retrospective, you have a wash up meeting, you have your daily huddle, whatever you may call them. These meetings where you examine what happened in this incident, how you were alerted, whether we could have proactively reduce the possibility of it happening, whether we could have automatically fixed it, what lessons can we learn for the next time? And one of your colleagues has had a full night's sleep and enjoyed two lots of espresso before coming to work, or okay, joining a Teams meeting with their shirt on, honestly, everything else is dressed. And they're coming through and they say, no, 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 if it was 934, then it would have been doing this and this and the other. Are you sure it's 934? You're yes, yeah, absolutely. Definitely. It was definitely 934. Hang on a minute. And you go to your laptop and you open Management Studio and Management Studio crashes just like PowerPoint did for me. Or you close the, the query tab. And even if you'd used Azure Data Studio, you've still got the same problem. You press that cross. And the problem is, if you press that cross, then that 934 is just gone. It's gone. Completely gone. You can't get it back. Those results are gone. That story, to me, is the number one reason why DBAs should make use of Jupyter Notebooks. There are other benefits as well, but this is the number one reason. So let's go back to that question. What is a Jupyter Notebook? Well, if we're a DBA, find yourself on that list, and we are in that scenario where we're res responding to an incident, how much better would it be if we could keep the results with the code that we ran. And I've forgotten which version, that's okay then, of the, of the PowerPoint I'm running, but that's, that's cool. Um, so, a Jupyter Notebook. It's a document that can contain text, executable code, images, and query results. How cool is that? So to run Jupyter Notebooks, I suggest the best way for you as a DBA is to make use of Azure Data Studio. Azure Data Studio is the cross-platform desktop environment for data, prof per, uh, data professionals. And the first most obvious question is, so it's only for Azure? No. No, it will work against all supported versions of SQL Server. Of course, it has extra functionality um, that gives it other things to do with things like big data clusters, managed instance, Azure SQL database, all of those things, it's gonna do a little bit more. But all supported versions, it's gonna do everything that it does. If you're just running queries, you'll probably find it will work against SQL Server just like Management Studio does. Because I know some of you have got SQL 2000 boxes out there and probably some older. But Rob, looks just like Visual Studio Code. Well, yeah, that's Visual Studio Code on the left and Azure Data Studio on the right, or perhaps it's the other way around. We've got the same code base underneath these two products. 
literally Visual Studio Code will be based on uh, this month's version of Visual Studio Code for the stable release and yesterday's version of the Insiders release, which is released on a daily cadence. So why have we got two products? Why do we have Visual Studio Code and have Azure Data Studio? The answer I give is silly. It's a joke. But data people like pretty colors. That's the main difference. Let's be more sensible about it. In Azure Data Studio, there is the capability to add extra layers, extra widgets, extra functionality into the product, which generally is used to display information in charts, which are colorful, in such a In Visual Studio Code, which is more of a developer's IDE, that functionality isn't required so much. So this is why we have have the two differences. And Rob, is there yes. a cost for using uh, Azure Data Studio? Yep, there is. There is the amount of time it takes you to download from the browser. It's free. Both Visual Studio Code and uh, Azure Data Studio are both completely free offerings from Microsoft. Cool, thank you. So, I reckon it's time for a demo. And as you've seen, it's all a bit excitable, so anything could happen. And when you see the rest of my demo, you realize anything can happen because I'll just, we'll just have some fun. So please feel free, jump in, ask me questions. Jason can interrupt me anytime and we can go and learn what it is you want to know about Azure Data Studio. So first question, where do I get Azure Data Studio? Go to your favorite browser, and your favorite search engine and search for Google and then search for Azure Data Studio. And then you'll find a page that says, download and install Azure Data Studio. And look, you can pick any platform that you like. So if you're on a Windows, you're on a Mac, you're on one of the many Linux versions, there will be an installer available for you and you can download it and make use of it. And everything that I show you will work on both all platforms. You heard me talk about the Insiders version. So the Insiders version is released every day, updated every day. And you'll find the downloads for that a little bit further down. You come down to here and there's a Insiders build download. They're pretty much identical. The Insiders version every now and again, something weird will happen. But it does give you access to the new features as they come through, enables you to give feedback. Oh, feedback, it's an excellent point. If you search for GitHub Azure Data Studio, you can find the GitHub repository for Azure Data Studio. It is open source. If you fancy, you can get in and write code and make pull requests and make it all better for you. But the other option is to go, oh, I found a bug or I found something that doesn't work as I expected or wouldn't it be great if it did X? This is the place where you go and do that. It's also the place where you can go and see what's been, been done. So, you know, if we went down and found, I don't know, let's see, schema compared dialogue blank while loading. If we have a look at this one and you can see that it's got the labels triage done so somebody's already had a look at it what can we do and it's an enhancement and it's in the area of schema compare so you can go through and find things that you're interested in you want to be able to make better for azure data Studio. so let's sidetrack a little let's go ss let's go ssms User voice. Okay, number one, top requested feature for SQL Server Management Studio. Here we go. Interesting. That appears that my Zoom it has crashed as well. Zoom it. Thank you very much. There we go. So, dark theme. Number one request for SQL Server Management Studio is dark theme. It's really hard to do in Management Studio. Yes, I know, 
there are hacks and ways of doing it and go in and edit this file and change this and do that and then it kind of maybe sort of probably works a bit but it isn't so good let's open azure data studio you want dark mode we'll press f1 and what i'm going to do is i'm going to toggle screencast mode which means that you should be able to see the key presses that I make. F1 or Control and Shift and P, or if you're on a Mac, Command and Shift and P, will bring up the command palette. This is the way to access all of the functionality within Azure Data Studio, the easiest way. Sure, there are menus and you can go through and find stuff. This is, to me, the easiest way of doing it. It also is exactly the same for Visual Studio Code because, hey, same code base. So if we go to color and spell it incorrectly, if you're an Englishman, you'll find that we've got a preferences color theme. And should you wish, you can work in dark mode or angry DBA mode or solarized dark mode. There are, in fact, many themes that you can add. I generally work in Atom 1. But a wise man told me that you should always do demos in a light theme. So I'm going to choose Quiet Light. Here's another cool thing. Uh, let's connect to, I wonder if you, are you up and running? Probably not, because everything's crashed. We'll do Docker PS minus A. And you've all crunched, so we will dive into. Oh, look at this! Visual Studio Code looks just like Azure Data Studio, and we have a Docker extension. We'll talk about extensions in a minute, and we're just going to start these two containers that have decided that they would like to be off, and then hopefully we can connect. There we go, bingo! We connect to an instance. So we can connect to an instance and we can do, uh, let's do, oh look, Azure Data Studio's got IntelliSense. So that's a good start. Let's start from sys.databases. Yeah, that'll do, we'll do that one. And then we'll do an F5 and we'll run. Look at that. We've got a query, we've got some results. Here's a cool thing, control and plus plus, everything gets bigger. So if you've got really good eyesight, you could have it really wide like this. Otherwise you could make it bigger, smaller, just with control plus plus or control minus minus and it'll bring it through. Let's do something else cool in Azure Data Studio. Let's take, those five columns and we will copy those with headers and then we'll do control a and we will paste and holy macaroni will you look at that it's just pasted the the columns and the rows that we've highlighted cool cool beans this is cool but we're talking about notebooks so let's open a notebook Let's start with one of these. What should we do? This is why this is why this this presentation is always different because I look at them and go, yeah, what should we do? Let's that's a there we go. Let's look at notebook and we will then explore what we've got so when we open a notebook a notebook has an ip ynb extension you can see that we've got some text up here at the top and then some code here and look we've got the results so the last time that it ran we can see that we've had 18 rows that it that's how long it took to run and here are our results and also some little buttons that allow us to save as CSV or save as Excel or JSON or uh, XML, big 
because I don't know, I wouldn't save it in XML or turn it into a chart. I know obviously this is a completely useless query for turning into a chart, but it shows that you can just click of a button and you can, you can then try and save it. So let's get rid of that. And we've got our results. So you've got a button here that says run all. That can run every single code cell that we've got, give us our results. Or you've got a button here, little blue one, and that one will just let you press play and go. You can see that we are in a SQL kernel and we can attach to a connection. Now, this still bugs me because it doesn't make sense, but if you look at that, we can select a connection and I want to drop down a connections but all you get is change connection change connection enables you to then go through and pick up a connection you can use windows authentication you can connect to azure active directory you can use sql auth because you're connecting to containers and we'll connect to that and then we'll press play i've got no idea there we go boom so that's just a t-sql so let's go back to our three o'clock in the morning story. So three o'clock in the morning, what I could do is I could wake up, I could start my Azure Data Studio, I could go and look for a notebook to do with audit, and and you're not going to work. That's interesting. I'm in the inside description, okay. But we've got all of the notebooks that are in this directory that's open, and I could pick up a notebook to do with, uh, well, we've got we've got the TC call gather permissions, and I could have found that in my list. This is the problem I think we're facing, or this is the explore system one notebook for incident management at three o'clock in the morning, and then we could click on that, and then my helpful colleagues and myself will have built up a notebook with some information at the top, maybe with some pictures, maybe some GIFs. Why GIFs? GIFs are for being silly? No, GIFs are for screencasts. You use a good screen recording software, you can export it as a GIF, you can embed it into your notebook. When words won't do, when pictures aren't good enough, little screencasts showing how stuff happens, saved as a GIF, embedded in your notebook, magic magic super good so we go through and we can just run this and then maybe we could grab some other information and then we could grab some other information and then we could see that andy levy's there and um, maybe we could grab some other information this is all just stuff and then we could just do uh file, save as, and we could save this as c slash, no, c slash temp, let's save it as cloud pass for IP YMB. And go away, reminder, thank you very much. So we'll save that, because one question that I get asked quite often is, how are the results saved? Well, let's have a look. Let's have a look at our notebook that we've got. So this is CloudPass IPYMB, and we've got some information written in. We've got some code here. Oh, there is all of the code, but we don't need to see it. We can hit that little arrow and it'll just minimize it. And then we have our results, so 41 rows affected, and you remember Andy Levy, Andy Levy was here, he's in this result set. So that's handy. I'm gonna save that just to make sure. And then I'm gonna do control and single quotes and I'm gonna open up and I'm gonna do a get content. And I'm gonna do C, oops, I'm gonna to fail to type completely C slash temp slash cloud pass. And I am going to pipe that to clip. So it's just going to come into my clipboard. It's just going to read that file raw for me, please. 
and then I'm going to come up here and I'm going to do control N. Uh, I'm not actually. In Azure Data Studio, control N will always open a SQL file and you can't change the language of the file, which is slightly frustrating. So if we do a new untitled file, I love it when things change. Let's try that again. That goes over there. Yeah, maybe they've changed it again. Let's do a new file. No, let's do a new untitled file, Rob. That's the one that you want. F1, new untitled file. You can go away. Let's do, I saw it there, change file encoding. And no, you're not going to do that. Um, there we go. Please. That stuff I said about not being able to change the language, complete rubbish. Used to be true, now it's complete rubbish. So we've copied the content of our Cloud Pass notebook. Uh, there it is. And we had Andy Levy. There he was. So let's do a control F in here and find that. Oh, look at that. So very important thing, especially for me as a SQL production DBA. If you save results in a notebook that have PPI in them, that have other data that you need to keep protected for some reason, then you need to make sure that you and anybody who could run this notebook takes proper care of this notebook because a notebook is just a file of JSON and it will hold the logins. So Andy is here in my results set, saved in my C drive up temp. If that got compromised, that data is just there out in the wild. So that's a warning. Number two warning. Yes, if for some reason this query brings back two gigabytes of data, this file, which is already 10,000 lines long, will be two gigabytes of data plus. Our Azure Data Studio doesn't work very well when it's two gigabytes of data. <laughs> in a notebook. In fact, it probably won't open the notebook at all. So two important points to, to keep in mind. But as well as using a notebook for instant management, for, oh, I need to troubleshoot something. I mean, I will often go F1 notebook. Um, and you know, client DBA asked me to investigate the containers. I know I probably would have um, errors in. I've got to be careful. I've got a touch screen mute and I talk with my hands. Um, I probably would have spelling mistakes in it. And then I'd add a code cell, um, move it down, and I'll start you know, the SP2, I'll connect to my container, and I'll start running. And you know, I literally will start doing stuff like this because it's here, it's already here. Hey, here's something cool. Oh no, my Azure Data Studio is gone. Oh, it's terrible. Let's reopen it. I'll reopen Azure Data Studio. Holy macaroni, will you look at that? Oh, I might have done it just slightly too quick. Oh, I did too. It is possible to lose your results by doing that, but they will normally, if you've given it a moment to do the autosave, it will have saved the results as well. But let's let's move on. Let's move away from investigation. investigation. Let's go to something else. How about if we want to do things that we do regularly? We've got some sort of um, run book for something. Maybe we want to do something like um, 
Ooh, I don't know if this will work. We'll find out. Maybe I want to see when my instance is when my agent jobs have been running. I've got an ETL process and start this, I think. I think this might have more on it. And I want to see what jobs are running at which time. When have my ETL jobs been running? Because it feels like one of them is beginning to overrun into the time that another one's doing. So, oh, maybe I did do it against a container. Okay, so I've got some code here, and I'm going to run this code. It's going to run some PowerShell. So now you see we're in a kernel called PowerShell, and we didn't really talk about kernels. Oh, that's a good one, isn't it, Rob? That's got absolutely nothing on it. Let's try this instead and see if we get something better and while it's yeah. running rob um is sure. there a limit on the max number of records that can be received by default um by default i don't believe that there is okay um simply because before you get to any like maximum number you know the thing will just crash it just literally just won't work Okay, and then so, if a, cool. and if a query takes a while to run, um, is there a way to run them and save the output, i.e., kick it off before going to bed or whatever, and then pick it up in the morning? <laughs> okay. See, this is why I love this session. Let's do that. Um, let's connect to the Beard Desktop, and. We're going to manage, so Azure Data Studio, let's have a manage and let's see if the agent is running. Looks that way. Uh, bit service SQL server agent, start. Start service. Okay, how about this? How about you just schedule it with to run as an agent job? So quite often, if I'm at clients where they cut you off, your VPN is not going to last, your RDP session isn't going to work, we'll put a load of code embedded into an agent job, let that run, and away it goes. Well, if we look here, we have got, uh, let's not pick that one because that one's rubbish. Let's go for the T-SQL one. I'm going to show you the same one again, but it's because I know that it'll work. So we can. If we look here, SQL agent, we've managed our instance, we've got notebooks, and it says new notebook job. So we'll click that. No, we'll... new notebooks are not job vacancies. Apparently Alexa thinks that new notebooks are not job vacancies. Wow. <laughs> so we can put in the path to our notebook that we've written and uh, we can select the storage database and that is as you can see here uh, of course as you can't see here because zoom it won't show you the uh, pop-up it, it's the database where all the job metadata is stored for this um for this agent job so i'm going to put it in tempdb don't ever put it in tempdb but it means i don't have to think about cleaning it up later and then we're going to pick an execution database and I'm going to put that in tempdb because I don't have to worry about doing anything later. And I'm going to call this cloud pass job. Uh, we'll leave it as SA and we could put a schedule and a description and we'll say okay. <clears throat> so now if we go and look into our tempdb, what we're going to find is <clears throat> two tables. We've got the materialized table it's got the id it's got a runtime a run date the notebook a notebook error you're beginning to see what sort of information in here and we've got a template and that's going to have a template id the job id it's going to match back to our job and notebook the execute database is tempdb we look at the notebook hey it's just some json and you know what that means yep that is our actual notebook so we will, uh, do we run it from there? Yes, we do. Click on that, we're gonna click run. The job 
was successfully started. So let's see what we get. Oh, we get a refresh. Ah, that's a blow. And in here we've got interesting. Um, in here we've got um, uh, our results, and this is our notebook. So double clicking this is literally opening up the results of the notebook that was run by the agent job and you can see that it's worked because the server name is beard desktop and not as it was in our cloud pass where have you gone c temp this was the notebook that we um, <clears throat> that we used as our uh, template. You can see here we're using the container name, but the results of our cloud pass job have actually worked. So that's one way that you can do it. It's cool, isn't it? Have we got any more questions? distracting me yeah. into a different direction well the, the other question the the follow-up was was so in that case the notebook result would be on the sql desktop w via the agent job okay no cool. is, is that the question yeah where, that's would, the question. yeah where would the job results be okay so i obviously wasn't clear so when i said when we set the job up we've got a storage database and the storage database I've set as tempdb to save me from having to clear up later. And it's created these two tables. Now in these two tables, we've got the template. The template table has got this notebook and any other notebooks that I was to add if I was adding more jobs. This particular table, which was empty, as you can see, it's got nothing there. If I run it now, now we've got some results. So if I come back, and I'm going to run that again, so it started again. But here we've got the 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 date it was run, the time it was run, 1941. This is the results. So this literally is my notebook. So I could save that and I can open it, or I can come into this view in Azure Data Studio, and this is going to show me. Um, this is going to generate it in, as a notebook, but that's coming out of that table that we set to store the agent job results in okay neat isn't it so it's cool super <laughs> super super cool. i love it to bits it's so great so now we've got two runs and if we come back into here now we've got two entries in our table so that's cool now okay you can go to beard.media slash notebooks with a capital N because short L's are far hard. And that'll take you straight to my GitHub repository. There are all sorts of notebooks here. So you can find any notebooks that you want to. We've got not.net and we've got .NET notebooks. Uh, .NET interactive notebooks, I am not going to have time to tell you about now because we've gone off down a rabbit warren which is cool but yeah um they enable you to run powershell c sharp and f sharp in .NET core so they're truly cross compatible if we look in the not .NET folder and we looked at dba tools um we'll see uh oh, not very many contain not very many notebooks there there's a reason I've shown you that. But we'll go back again and we'll look in audit. Uh, maybe this time we're going to get instant permissions to Excel. So let's do two things. Let's look at, holy moly, can you see that your notebook in GitHub is rendered like a notebook? Not executable, but it's rendered. These are the results of running this query here. That's cool. It's a really neat way of sharing our information. It's a really neat way of taking our documentation. So that's that's really cool. And you can also see that we've run some PowerShell here. Some PowerShell, I love PowerShell. 
And you also know now where you can go to download all of my things and all of these notebooks and use them for themselves. But I know, I know that you've got your own um, run books, probably in something like OneNote. So I would say that in OneNote, you're going to have something like, not show that page, let's show this page instead. There we go. You've probably got something that looks a bit like this. You've got a OneNote document. It's got some information, some pictures. This is a picture, look. And it's already there. So how do you turn that into a notebook? Watch this. Control A. I'll double Control A to make sure I get everything. Control C. And I'm going to go to... Azure Data Studio, and I'm going to press F1, and I'm going to do a new notebook, and I'm going to open code every time. I'm going to open a text block, and I'm going to go Control V, and would you look at that? We have just copied our OneNote with all of our formatting and all of our pictures, and put it straight bang into a notebook just like that. Do you want to put a table in? You've got an Excel document, you've got a Word document, you've got a website, you've got a website? Let's do it from a website. Uh, let's not do it from that website. Let's do it. In fact, no, let's do it from that. Let's see what happens. This might be kind of fun. So I couldn't find Jason when I came in, so I, I did that. So let's see if I copy, oh, is it going to work? Let's see if I copy this. How much of that have we got? We do control C there. And then we add ourselves a new text cell down here. And we paste that. <laughs> Look at this. It's not actually showing you the GIF, which is a little bit frustrating, but it's got that in there. Let's do something more realistic. Let's take this. There we go. And we will copy that. And we see we've got some links and some images and some stuff here. And we will put that into our notebook. Let's add a new text cell. And we will paste into there. We've got the icon. We've got the link to the icon. It's going to go to the place that we expect it to go to. That's neat. That's neat. I think that's neat. So let's come back to Jupyter Notebooks. Let's come back to our .NET Notebooks. And our .NET Notebooks have got something awesomely cool about DBA tools. So you've got uh, 10, eight, eight or so notebooks here. They're going to more are going to come. And it says create containers is the number one. And what this does will create the containers for the notebooks for exploring DBA tools. So what I've done is I've written a load of notebooks that include everything you need to do to be able to set up your own containers in Docker and interact with them with DBA tools. Now, the problem with this is they're all in .NET notebooks. Only somebody had written a PowerShell module to help you with that. As it happened, because I'm trying to do something else, which I'll tell you in a minute, what I've done is I have a module called ADS Notebook, and I've got a command called convert ads.net to not.net. And I'm pretty sure it's going to work. So what we have over here is our .NET Notebooks for DBA tools. So we're going to copy that path. And what we also have is our not.net notebooks. I know it's confusing, but I don't name things. Uh, DBA tools, and that's only got two of them in. With ADS notebook, we can, that is all of them, good. We can get all of our notebooks from there, and then we can put them into not.net by converting them. Because remember, it's just JSON underneath the hood. Uh -huh. I literally don't know if this is going to work or not, but it's kind of cool. 
Um, it looks like we have no warnings apart from this doesn't appear to be a notebook, which is fair enough. So let's go and have a look and see what we've got in our not 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 net not folder, and we've got all of our notebooks. And if we click on them, they open, and they're running as PowerShell notebooks. Which means that if we did something like this, because I know that those two containers are associated with this. We could look at how cool DBA Tools is for doing backups by running some PowerShell. We've got connections to our containers. So we could look at our default backup file. And we have got some, we have got some backups on there. So let's calm down a bit. Because I can't remember where the folder path. Right there. So the users, Mr. Rob, documents, DBA tools demo, SQL one. Let's delete all the backups. Don't ever just delete the backups, please. Okay, so let's have a look at this. So get DBA file is gonna look into a directory from the point of view of the service account. And as you can see, there's nothing in there. You've just seen me delete everything, so you know there's nothing in there. So now you've walked into an estate and you realize that none of the instances have got uh, any backups. And you have a look with get DBA last backup and you see that the last full backup um, was some days ago that's only three days ago but maybe it's two years ago backup dba database sql instance credential because we're in a container we'll give it a path we'll go like that oh that's sql2 let's have a look at this there we go there's our databases backed up bang and okay, they're little databases, but you can see how simple it is. One line of code we've used just to back up an entire instance, bang. But they're all in the same directory. Okay, well, that's true, they are. How about if you wanted to put them in their own directory for each database? It's okay, we'll just add this create folder. cool is that really simple it's really easy to do but i'm not telling you about dba tools go and have a look at the website go and grab the book from us that's all fine you can now use the notebooks in fact i'll upload these to the jupyter notebooks github in a while um you can use notebooks to show off your project whether your project is a cool open source thing you're involved in whether it's the latest thing you've done for the company, the thing you did on the Friday afternoon hackathon, just some improvements that you've made, the lunch and learn demonstration that you're going to give to your colleagues. This is what I learned about how to do this thing. Put it all into, into a notebook, then you can share it. So those are all of the reasons that I think notebooks are cool. And there are a million more reasons why. But hopefully what I've done is I've given you some ideas of how you can do stuff and take things forward. And I've forgotten the other one. So we talked about extensions. So we've got extensions. You can add all sorts of extensions. Now, one thing you can do is you can install from your own VSIX. And I have no idea if I even have it on this machine. Oh, I said do. So one thing you can do is you can install the VSIX, which is just our extension. So this is just one that I haven't finished properly yet, but we're gonna get there. And 
will say yes please i'd like to install this extension please reload okay i'll reload thank you very much for helping me and when we reload what we get is somewhere over here dba tools lab.net it's a dotnet interactive notebooks extension so wait some more information about it and we've got a command called launch book dba tools lab.net so before we do that we are going to close this workspace completely uh nope we don't want to save any of that that's fine and then we're going to press f1 and we're going to play launch book dba tools lab.net and what that's done is that's opened us up a jupyter book you see it over here on the right we're in a notebooks tab and this book has got some uh it's opened up the first chapter create containers first here you go this is a notebook you've just seen the results of this create the containers got all the pictures and everything about how to create the containers yeah he's starting as a dotnet powershell one at the moment but this is our backups and restores now we've got it installed as an extension it's really simple to create your own set your own jupyter book from a set of notebooks which you could then share with your colleagues so let's go back three o'clock in the morning now i could open up my azure data studio which has got the extension loaded into it which means i can just launch troubleshooting notebook Oof. and then there'll be 10 15 20 jupyter notebooks there ready for me to do my troubleshooting and find out what's wrong and get back to bed earlier that's a whole load of stuff so fire me questions ask me things i'm always happy to answer them all right so we did get one question here that i missed uh can you mix languages in a notebook a wonderful question one that we're asked often so let's uh f1 new notebook now we're going to have a kernel of sql um, which means I am going to be able to run select star from. What I can't do is run any PowerShell. I can't even run any of these other languages. It's not possible. And please don't think that you can say, because this is documentation, Rob, I can just tell the user to switch language. <clears throat> I can tell them to do that, but it probably won't work. But if we open a Go to, um, nope, let's not go to Kubernetes, even though it's cool. Oh, come on. I've broken it, look at that. If we go to, uh, if we open a .NET notebook, then yes, we can with the use of magic commands, which is what I was going to show you until Azure Data Studio or more likely my machine decided that it wasn't going to play. Let's see what happens if we try this. No, thank you, don't want to release, release, release notes. Right, uh, let's open the folder. Oh, I've done exactly the same thing again, can you believe it? Right, you're gonna let me go back. Beautiful. This, I promise you, is my machine, which has been problematic, as you saw, when we were looking for, uh, uh, well, from the moment that PowerPoint wouldn't start earlier. Right, do this bit slowly, Rob. There we go. We're opening a file, so we'll go notebooks, we'll go .NET notebooks, and we'll go mix and match. Okay. So, in a .NET interactive notebook, and if you want to know how to install them and all the things to do with that, go and Google .NET interactive notebooks and read Maria's, note, read Maria's blog post. 
but you can run have you finished loading yes you have you can run powershell and c sharp in the same notebook and that's literally what we've got going here and we are going to um pass our results between c sharp and powershell within the same notebook so we've set a variable from c sharp using this magic command to say this bit of code is c sharp and then we've then set our variable and then we've read our variable here in dotnet powershell powershell core powershell 7. i know it's cool isn't it mate? um unfortunately it's not available in not.net notebooks <clears throat> okay uh let's see here there's one a couple more questions here that we have probably have time for uh if all your databases are azure sql ones can you schedule the notebook jobs as a runbook or is there another workaround for the lack of an agent oh that's an awesome question um if they are all azure sql databases then you're going to have to schedule them in another way can you run them i think you probably could um i think you probably could with a bit of PowerShell and the SQL Server module. But okay. I'd have to I'd have to go and look at it. I've one of the things with those um Jupyter can you hear me. One of the one of the things with those Jupyter uh, notebook agent jobs is they won't run on uh, SQL twenty fourteen. And the first time at a client that I needed them was of course on a client that was running SQL twenty fourteen. Um, yeah so i had to rewrite the powershell code which is behind those agent jobs to run in dba tools so um i don't have that code obviously because it's living in a in a client's instant but um i would think that if you used that code you would be able to run it in a runbook or in azure automation or a function or any of those other ways of doing stuff cool and then uh, I think this is the one we'll have last, last that we'll have time for us. How would you utilize notebooks with a change management methodology to ensure proper control? Um, so as we've already discussed, notebooks are um, just flat files, they're just JSON files. So um, you can just source control them. And that is absolutely no thank you very much that is absolutely what i do with 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 clients so if we look in this particular folder and we look in our source control you can see that you saw me just create these new um not.net dba tools notebooks um but this one's got an m so this one's modified so we can go through and we can do a diff within our ads so what we do uh, there are numbers numbers of things that you can do but you can include this in a ci cd process so we had a ci cd process that would create the uh, an index of troubleshooting notebooks so a front notebook that's out on top and deliver it out to the jump boxes that people used we did that with I think that was TFS and that was all put into CI CD with approval gates and all the rest of it we've also used it the other way around where we've used notebooks to assign permissions or to gather permissions audit permissions and we have um, pushed those to then run every night every week to then save the results and commit them into code so that then you can see what has happened in your source control history you can look at the git log you can see the changes to see what permissions were assigned when so you see if somebody decided to assign themselves some permissions to a database as long as it got caught with that automation 
So um, absolutely you can do all of that because it's just source control. Um, other things that you could do is you could write code, especially with PowerShell and um, enabling people to be able to run code they don't understand. You could write code to do things like export all the permissions out into an Excel document and give that to the change management team and say, there you go, you need that information, stop asking, it, stop asking me for it every week because you're late to your meeting and you need it now, you know, your lack of planning is generally not my, my reason to rush. If I can give them a notebook, then they can just run it through themselves. All right, excellent. Uh, well, that's all we have time for for today. Um, Rob, thank you for doing this. This is actually something I'm gonna have to dig into quite a bit because obviously I'm missing out on here, <laughs> missing out here because this, I can, I can, I can see where I can use start using this absolutely today, yep. and ho hopefully everyone else that uh, was on the call today uh, agrees. So, oh, thank, thank you very much. very much for having me. Let me oh, yeah. flip back to there. Yeah, All thank right. you very much for having me. And um, yeah, get in touch with me. My name is Rob Sewell, um, SQL DBA with Beard on Twitter. Happy to answer questions. All right. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, thank you, Rob, again for uh, presenting. And with that, I'm just going to sign us out for the today. And everyone have a great rest of your day.